Hello and welcome to the Trans Plus Wellness Panel. Today we are going to be hearing from our incredible panelists about the large intersection between the Trans Plus community and mental health. We'll be talking about accommodations and resources available, as well as how the Trans Plus community and mental health mesh together. We hope you leave today feeling empowered to reach out to your employer for resources you need to better your day-to-day -day life. Mental health may feel like an invisible battle, but we are not alone and you are not alone. I wanna get started with some introductions. My name is Grace Taylor. My pronouns are she, her. I'll be your moderator today. I'm on the QuickBooks Sales Learning and Development team as an instructional designer and an, a remote employee based in Chicago. I'm here today as an ally and an advocate. I'm gonna let our panelists introduce themselves now. Laura, do you wanna kick us off? Absolutely, thank you so much, Grace. Uh, my name is Laura Perkins, that's Laura is in folklore. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. I've been with Intuit for about four years now as a senior risk analyst in risk operations. I'm also a member of the Trans Advisory Board here at Intuit, in addition to serving in the uh, steering committee for our Global Pride ERG as the brand and design program manager. I like to stay busy, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm here today to talk about my experience as a trans non-binary individual who also has bipolar, autism, ADHD, and PTSD to name a few. I'll throw it to Lyric. Hey everybody, my name is Lyric. I am a trans man. I use he, him pronouns. I've been with Intuit for two years this month, which is exciting. Um, I work in the QuickBooks cleanup team as an expert bookkeeper. I'm super excited to be on the panel today to share my stories and have an open conversation. I'll shoot it to Christopher. Awesome, thank you. <coughs> Christopher Hart here. Um, I'm a benefits manager. I came via the MailChimp acquisition in 2021. Um, I manage the benefits team uh, here at Intuit and that includes the absence and accommodations team. Um, and I am based in Atlanta. Uh, with my husband and a uh, two and a half year old toddler, um, fun times. And um, <laughs> I'm here as an uh, advocate and ally. Awesome, thank you all so much for being here today. Before we get started, I do wanna provide our audience with a trigger warning. Today we will be hearing about stories that involve misgendering, a slight physical altercation, and mental health. If this is something you don't feel like you have the mental capacity for at this time, or if at any point it becomes too much in the session, Feel free to leave us and join us again later. So let's get started with question one. I think it's safe to say that trans plus inclusivity varies widely from company to company and sometimes even location to location within a company. This can include misgendering of pronouns, gendered labels on bathroom signs, and lack of access to hygiene products. Add a mental or physical disability on top of this and that's a lot for anyone to handle. How do you navigate this environment and what are some ways that businesses can be inclusive that wouldn't be incredibly costly? You know, I think that's a really great question. I think that, you know, inclu inclusivity is a priceless and costless attribute that a business can have. Um, it, you don't have to pay any money for it. It's a very simple thing. Um, and it brings up a story. One time me and my friend were <clears throat> going into the restroom at college and at the time I didn't pass um, so and I also felt more comfortable using a female restroom so we're both walking into the female restroom and while I'm in the doorway this guy grabs me and yanks me out of the restroom and he's like yelling at me and like how dare you go in there guys aren't allowed in there like what are you what are you thinking and he's like going on and on and in that split second I felt so many emotions right like my first emotion was oh my gosh, I did it, I passed. <laughs> he thinks I'm a guy, like this is exciting. And at the same time, I was like, but I still have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, you know, I, I did end up saying like, I'm, I'm female, this is the right bathroom I'm supposed to use. Because I was worried, you know, being on campus, I didn't know if he was like security, if I was gonna get in trouble or something like that. So, you know, he apologized, he was you know, really sorry. It was awkward, but, you know, this is a prime example of what can be avoided if we have gender neutral bathrooms in businesses and at companies. Um, you don't have to worry about, well, is that person going in the right restroom? Like he didn't mean anything by it. He was thinking from a safety concern. All he saw was a man following a woman into a restroom and he reacted, you know, so I couldn't blame him for it, you know, and I think that being able to have stalls that are gender neutral is a very big thing that a, that a business can have. And like, I know that 
a lot of businesses nowadays have stalled restrooms. So that would be something that would be a long-term goal, like down the road to revamp those restrooms to be more gender neutral. Um, and some businesses offer hygiene products in the female's restroom. You can also offer those same products in the men's restroom, you know, have trash cans in the stalls or in the restrooms for regardless of who's using them. And also to not call them feminine hygiene products or feminine products, just simply calling them hygiene products is a good way for a business to be inclusive. Yeah, those are really great examples, Lyric. And bathroom signage, excuse me, bathroom signage and hygiene products are really great ways that you can help make people feel more comfortable in physical spaces. You can actually do the same thing in online spaces by adding your pronouns to your email signature, as well as Zoom, Slack, anywhere else that appears. Um, if you're a people leader, take the opportunity, lead by example. Introduce yourself with your pronouns. It's really simple. Hi. My name's Lore, my pronouns are they, them. Um, no need to complicate it. Um, also familiarizing yourself with basic inclusive language practices. Um, it only costs a little bit of time and it's time well spent. <sighs> it's not about um, being PC, it's about minimizing harm. Um, a good general rule is just to be specific. Um, to Lyric's example, you can just say, um, you know, all gender restroom or restroom with urinals in instead of men's restroom. Um, you can flag the relevant information without actually bringing unnecessary gendered language into it. Um, uh, I'm actually part of a project team here at Intuit along with our amazing host, Mark Serber, and the lovely Dana Lewis from TurboTax Live. If you'd like to know more about some best practices around inclusive language, we'd love to talk to you, whether you're inside or outside of Intuit. Um, and another way you can help trans folks feel more comfortable in online spaces is just allow us to go off camera. Um, this can be a boon to mental health for cisgender folks too, but um, there is a reason so many trans people came out during the pandemic. I actually uh, wrote in an op-ed for the Harvard Business Review about how being able to go off camera early in the pandemic allowed me this sort of curtain that I could open and close at will, and behind it I could sort of experiment with my gender expression and not have to worry about trying to explain it to anyone or, or put it in words before I was ready to. Um, another really big thing for mental health and trans employees is addressing the pain points around the name and gender marker change process. Um, I know that our trans advisory board here has done a lot of really great partnership with HR and benefits teams to try to create guides and improve the process. Um, that being said, there's, there's always room for improvement. Um, I know I and a couple of TAB colleagues every so often log into a system years after your name change and, and you're greeted with your dead name. Um, it doesn't feel great, but it happens. Um, but when our leaders try to take point on this, um, it takes a lot of the mental and emotional strain off of us. Um, these are just a couple of the obstacles that we face. Um, there's incredibly onerous processes to changing your name and gender markers, among other things. It's really emotionally taxing every time you have to do it, and you have to do it time and time and time again. And as Rigo mentioned in the previous session, some people, depending on where you live or what your situation is, they're not even able to make that change. So um, please help wherever and whenever you can. Um, and also, before we move on to the next question, sorry, just one more thing. Um, I want to encourage everyone to opt in to self-ID in Workday, especially around your gender identity and pronouns. If we can get enough uh, participation in this, enough people to voluntarily opt in, this could potentially get businesses a lot of really important data around measuring impact for events like these and resourcing these events. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing these incredible suggestions. Christopher, could you talk a little bit about what work your benefits team does to create a more inclusive work environment? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> so the work that my team does, especially in the accommodation space, go hand in hand with accessibility and inclusion. Um, let's break it down for a second, right? So inclusion is uh, the practice or policy of providing um, just access to opportunities and resources that excluded or marginalized um, groups such as uh, uh, physical and intellectual disabilities or minority groups may not have already have access to, right? So basically it, it allows them to bring their true self to work, their whole true self to work. And then 
the next component of that is accessibility, right? So accessibility is the practice or um, just assuring employees have easy access, whether able or disabled, to the information, to the activities and, and or the environments of their uh, work locations. And then of course you have uh, the part of accessibility that is not just the physical, right? It's so much more than just that physical access. And then of course there's accommodations, which is a modification or adjustment to um, an individual who has a proven uh, need substantiated by a medical provider, or it could be religious driven as well. Um, and it's just the opportunity for them to enjoy equal opp employment opportunities as well. Um, and that need can vary. It can be anything from just physical, mental, emotional. It could be uh, religious or academic. It can be anything employment related, to be quite honest. Um, and that's kind of how my team jumps in to help, right? We partner with those accessibility teams and DEI teams or diversity, equity, and inclusion teams to uh, just kind of make that holistic approach, right? Where we are wanting to uh, just ensure that employees have the ability to have a reasonable accommodation. We identify those trends. We uh, partner with those different groups to uh, just make the workplace more accessible and inclusive. Awesome, thank you so much, Christopher. So it's no secret that people work half of their lives. If our employers or our coworkers don't meet our needs, our mental health suffers. In fact, in a survey done of transgender individuals over the age of 18, done by the US Transgender Survey, revealed that many of their respondents frequently experience discrimination and mistreatment. Of those respondents, 39% reported serious psychological damage compared to just 5% of the US population. Could you talk a little bit about your experience with this? I could probably talk a lot about my experience with this, but we only have so much time, so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so before coming to Intuit, I actually worked in the entertainment industry for about 15 years. I was a scenic artist. I painted sets for TV, film, theater, theme parks, award shows, basically anything you can imagine. Um, I also led paint and design teams on uh, those projects. I um, should have been living my dream on paper I was, but um, you know, due to all of the harassment and discrimination, frankly, um, it was more of a nightmare. Um, to touch on what Lyric said a moment ago, um, you know, bathrooms have been a contentious issue for, um, for several years now. Um, I can remember my first day at a brand new scene shop. Um, I didn't know anybody there, but I made fast friends with this woman that I would later find out is trans. Um, we're chatting and, you know, just painting a wall like you do. And she goes to get another gallon of paint. And the second she leaves, this, again, total and complete stranger walks up to me and asks me how I feel about that man, his words, using the same restroom as me. Um, to be completely honest, I had no idea what he was talking about at first. All I knew about this woman was her name and that she's a really good painter. Um, but once I took his meaning, I definitely told him where he could go. Um, <laughs> this is just the most obvious and glaring example. Um, there, there are plenty of others of varying degrees of subtlety and lots of homophobia too. Um, people like to tell you the entertainment industry is very liberal and progressive. Um, in a lot of cases, that's a fiction. I remember one shop that I worked in, all of the carpenters and even the technical director, the man whose job it was to oversee the entire shop, would write on little post-it notes for each other, don't be gay, and just post them all over the shop. Um, there's also a lot of misogyny. Um, I was assigned female at birth and was femme presenting at the time. Um, I dealt with lots of sexual harassment and humiliation, sometimes from leadership, and I saw a lot of other folks go through it too. Um, you know, these people never faced any consequences, and in fact, I saw lots of people penalized for not just speaking up, but just standing up for themselves. Um, I cannot overstate the impact this had on my mental health. Um, it greatly worsened my depressive episodes with bipolar. My anxiety was completely out of control. I developed stomach ulcers. I had chronic GERD. Um, and even though my mental health is, is far from a walk in the park now, um, things have gotten so, so much better for me since coming to Intuit. 
Um, that being said, there are still hiccups here and there, regardless of where you are, you know. Um, I remember a manager on a team I was assisting with a project um, <laughs> took me on a walk through a veritable garden of microaggressions, um, especially around my gender identity and my mental health. Um, she was incredibly dismissive of the difficulties that I faced around my name and gender marker change. Um, she would joke about it to her team. Um, even worse, the jokes weren't funny. Um, she also told me at one point that I should stop being so bipolar. Um, she didn't know anything about my mental health history, but, um, you know, that one hurt a little bit. So I got a fantastic HR rep involved in the conversation. She was able to facilitate what was a difficult conversation. And honestly, we, we didn't change any hearts or minds. Um, you know, the manager remained convinced that we were overreacting even after we explained specifically how harmful this, this kind of language can be. But um, HR was able to facilitate that conversation and work with my manager to pull me off of that project and get me out of that toxic environment. Um, and that was uh, really essential for me. Um, and I feel like I should mention in this conversation, I am a person who walks through life benefiting from a lot of privileges. Um, I'm, I, I have a relatively easy experience compared with lots of other, especially trans people. I can't even begin to imagine how much more difficult things must be, um, for example, for black trans women or for queer disabled immigrants and what their experiences might be like. And I think when it comes to work and mental health, it, things can get really hairy really quickly. <laughs> um, so I, there was one time I was at a job interview and the job interview was going fantastic. Like one of those job interviews where you know you could start as soon as this interview's over and like they love you. And so we're talking back and forth and having questions. And so I mentioned, by the way, I go by Lyric instead of my birth name. And they immediately said, well, we have to put your legal name on your name tag and all your paperwork. Like that's just what we have to do. And I was a little taken aback by this because there were people actually working with nicknames on their name tags. So I was kind of like, that's kind of weird, but okay. And, you know, I'm, the, I'm a very open and out trans man. Um, all my friends know, my family knows. Um, I like talking about it because why not educate, right? And, but I do, you know, I do be, I am cautious, right? Like when I'm meeting new people or in a new environment, I tend to like feel things out and have conversation and see if this person or this environment is a safe place for me to just say, by the way, I'm trans, you know? So in this job interview, I was kind of doing that and I thought it was going in the right direction, but that one, <laughs> one sentence when they said no, I was like, okay, well, that's not coming out today. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was tough. Like I ended up having to take the job because I had bills to pay and you know, I didn't have a choice but to take it. And I had to live two separate lives. So in my personal life, I was my true self and you know, being me and being trans and going by Lyric. And then at work, I had this mask on and I had to pretend to be this whole other person. I had to use she or her pronouns and I went by my birth name and it was, it was so like, I was so anxious all the time. Every day I went to work, I was so anxious. And it just, it definitely impacts your mental health drastically having to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that you bring up, you know, not just trans folks, but folks in lots of minority groups are sort of uh, constantly on alert and performing that calculus of, is this safe, is, is this a safe space for me? Is this person safe? Um, and even sometimes when people self-identify as a safe person, you have to take that with a little grain of salt. Um, I remember a few years ago, uh, for example, I was looking for a therapist and it was really important to me to find a therapist that was LGBT friendly. So I did a ton of research, um, as is my tendency, and I found a person who not only on Psychology Today were they listed as LGBT friendly, but gender and sexuality were some of their um, areas of focus. I later found out she was a gender studies minor. So it was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. I found this person, she gets it. I won't have to explain anything to her. 
And uh, for a while, things went really great. Um, she was obviously sort of relating to me as a woman, which I, I definitely didn't appreciate, but I thought it was sort of an unpleasant side effect of just discussing my experiences around um, physical and sexual abuse, which uh, does impact assigned female at birth uh, folks as well as trans women disproportionately. Um, she would uh, misgender and dead name me uh, kind of a lot, and I was very patient for a long time with her, for a very long time. And then one day I asked her, you know, could you put a little more effort into this, just try to get my name and pronouns correct. She told me that was a completely unreasonable expectation because my legal name and legal gender were on file in the system, and, you know, she's very busy and has a lot of patience. Um, so I started looking for a new therapist immediately, um, as you can imagine. Um, I did see her for another couple of weeks, and in that time I mentioned, you know, I want to start uh, exploring options around medical transition for me, and it was her entire tone changed. Um, she told me that she thought that I should completely resolve and work through all of my past traumas before exploring any options around medical transition. Um, and, you know, regardless of, of whether or not I think that's a realistic therapy goal um, to totally and completely resolve all past trauma, um, it's, it's eerily similar to, um, and in fact is, is basically a turf talking point, those trans exclusionary radical feminists. And it was far beyond anything I was willing to put up with from her. Um, she actually sent me a note this past Trans Day of Visibility uh, explaining to me that she wasn't being transphobic. Um, <laughs> yeah, people. Uh, and um, uh, I, I told her, you know, don't worry, I have, a, I have a much better therapist now. And I do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love when people are like, oh, I'm not being transphobic. No, you just don't want to get called out right at this moment. That's what's happening. <laughs> but I think, you know, something to consider, everyone has different experiences and personal things that they're going through, you know, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, you know, background. Mental health is that small, silent monster in the back of your head, right? It's behind your eyes and nobody can see it. And it can creep up in a second, right? So I want to just put the audience in a different perspective, right? So pretend you have a job that is wonderful. You love the job itself, the job interview went great, it's fantastic. However, there's one thing about you that you can't control that all your other coworkers don't have. They don't relate to. Maybe it's the color of your skin, maybe you're younger than all your coworkers or you're older than all your coworkers, or maybe you know if a new process rolls out, you're, it takes you a little bit longer to get the gist of how to, how to do it, right? And so mentally already, you're feeling kind of like an outcast, right? You're feeling put aside because you don't relate to all your other coworkers because of that one thing you can't control. Now on top of that, you're trans. So now you've got two things that are completely out of your control that affect your mental health. And that intersectionality between those can drastically impact you. And I think that, you know, it's, it's definitely something to keep in mind. And with businesses, the, the simple gesture of a, allowing somebody to go by their name and their pronoun can affect them in such a positive way. Like you're automatically setting the tone of this is a safe environment. We want you to go by who you are and bring your true self to work. I love that. Um, that empathy piece is so, so crucial. Mm. And, you know, there's not, um, as I think all of us here, not a lot that I miss about the early days of the pandemic. Um, but I, I do miss the really amazing conversations that were being had around empathy and leading with emotional intelligence. Um, I feel like the general attitude of late has uh, shifted somewhat. Um, I see less effort being put forth to understand all of the stressors that we're under and how those can affect our mental health. And I, I really wish that we could return to those conversations in that attitude. Eric, Lore, thank you so much for sharing your stories and for your vulnerability. Um, I know that these are experiences that you would rather not relive, but I know that the audience is listening and we actively want to work to make a change so that other people coming after us 
don't have to experience things like this. Mm -hmm. um, I want to shift the conversation a little bit now to what employees at Intuit and outside of Intuit can do if they need access to resources or accommodations. Christopher, could you talk a little bit about what that process looks like to ask for an accommodation and also about some of the Trans Plus benefits that we offer here at Intuit? Yes, for sure. Um, uh, before I dive in, I kind of want to just say thank you, uh, Lyric and Laura, for just sharing that. Ditto what Gracia said. Like that takes a tremendous amount of courage, and you know we definitely appreciate it. Um, so, kind of jumping into mental health, I'll start off with uh, just kind of overall what benefits are available here at Intuit. Um, so, Intuit partners with our medical providers, Cigna, United Health and a Kaiser to really be those agents of change and uh, just kind of uh, ensure that we are driving to address those health disparities uh, in marginalized and underrepresented uh, populations. So one of the things that, uh, or some of the trans benefits that we have at Intuit specifically can, uh, it, we have a number of them and I'll kind of go in the order of mental health first. So we do have teledoc, uh, behavioral health coaching. We have access to our EAP, which is Employee Assistance Program. Um, talk space, virgin posts, life coaches. We have Will, which is a mindfulness and uh, resilience program. Our Wellbeing for Life program. Um, and then Wisdom Labs, which is a mindfulness uh, communities and uh, they have monthly seminars as well. And then of course, uh, general benefits, we have her hormonal therapy, laboratory testing, preventive care screenings, and then also gender affirming and related surgeries. So with our gender affirming uh, care is both covered in Intuit benefits and also um, informed by the WPATH uh, standards backed by every major organization. Um, and then of course, we also have our accommodations. Um, so with our accommodations and our leave of absences, you know, uh, think about it from a perspective of like post-surgery, right? So with that, whenever you are, you can reach out to your HR department, you can reach out to, uh, if you have an intranet, those are places where you'll be able to see those policies around uh, leave of absences. So during that recovery period, you can use a leave of absence. And then also for just accommodations, kind of speaking to the experiences that Laura and Lyric just mentioned with those toxic work environments, those are absolutely the time to pull in HR. Um, you know, in those situations, you know, we um, employees basically have the ability to connect with their mental health therapists and if they're if those therapists can provide that substantiation and stuff like that under the ADA, they have the ability to request an accommodation to remove themselves from those work, uh, toxic work environments. Um, and that can be certified by those providers. And of course, accommodations come in so many different sizes, shapes, and flavors. Um, when we are conducting the accommodation process, we go through something called the interactive process, where we really understand what those needs and restrictions and limitations are. From there, we uh, connect with the department leads to understand what the options are, right? What are the things that we can explore for this accommodation for someone in this uh, situation? And then from there, we are your biggest advocates. We try to advocate for you and find that balance of where we can find a solution. And then what does a typical accommodation look like? Well, in this scenario, it could be training or coaching for that manager. It could be a situation where you, know, uh, you take a leave of absence for that mental health, or it can be a combination of both. But one of the things that we do here at Intuit specifically is we go above and beyond that. Remember the uh, partnership that we talked about as far as accessibility and DEI? Well, that could be an opportunity for us to provide a company-wide initiative where we are targeting uh, compassion or empathy training classes, an allyship program, or a workshop to eliminate the negative stigma around mental health and disabilities. Um, so my team is currently proactively collaborating on solutions like that. Um, just to add on while uh, referring back to the trans healthcare benefits, um, all recommended healthcare options in the WPATH, that's the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, um, everything in their standards of care should be covered by essentially 
all major insurance providers. Um, and if you work it into it and you're having issues getting coverage for things that should be covered, um, please reach out to one of the members of the Trans Advisory Board and tag us in on the conversation. We've been able to um, really you know, make things happen for lots of folks who've been having issues in this area in partnership with uh, amazing folks on our benefits team like Christopher here. Oh, thank you both so much for that. I, I just feel so blessed to work at this company with such incredible inclusive benefits. Um, Laura, Lyric, is there anything else you wanted to say to wrap up this conversation? Um, sure. Um, so uh, there is sort of a um, significant statistical overlap uh, between neurodivergent folks and uh, the trans community. Um, I get a lot of um, uh, questions about it because being very open and honest about my experiences. Um, and a lot of folks ask, like, you know, why don't you just tell everyone that you have autism and bipolar and just avoid communication problems? Um, and I want to be very clear about this. Um, it's not my job and it's not anybody else's job to disclose your mental health history to anyone if you are not comfortable doing so. Mental health is your health, period. Um, it's actually covered by HIPAA, and um, it's sort of illegal to demand disclosure. Um, you need uh, patient consent and knowledge to do that. Um, the question also sort of assumes that I'm going to have communication problems, and uh, I definitely push back against that. Um, I prefer to live in a world where we can meet people with compassion when maybe our first impulse is to assume that they're just being difficult. Um, as a person whose recorded gender at birth was female and a person who has bipolar too, um, I've been called difficult a lot, um, as have a lot of folks who fit that bill. Um, but if you take a moment and try to have that compassion, you can just see a human being doing their best to understand and to be understood. You don't need to have, you shouldn't need to have full comprehension of someone's mental health history to have compassion for them. Leave room to consider the invisible. And don't force neurodivergent folks to assimilate into neurotypical communication styles. A lot of folks call this masking. Um, and uh, it, it can be a painful process. It's a lot like a square peg in a round hole. Um, for personal accommodations, uh, that can be kind of a tricky issue. Um, first, you have to out yourself. That's an understandable hard stop for a lot of folks, even if it's only with HR. Um, second, it can be difficult figuring out exactly what is right for you. Um, I know personally I've leaned a lot on online communities and online disability spaces for recommendations and best practices. Um, a really big one for me was uh, noise reducing earplugs. Um, that was a really big help. Also um, quiet rooms, other sensory concerns, um, allowing for text-based communication if that's someone's preference. That can be a really big deal for them. Um, sharing agendas in advance of a meeting um, there are lots of things you can do. I recommend that you all take a moment to look into that. Um, having an honest, open, and probably most importantly, a continuing dialogue um, with your manager and leadership is very crucial. And I want to shout out my amazing manager, Adriana Gardner, and our team lead, Nikki Cordero. You're incredible people. They support me wonderfully. I would not be here today without them, and I am so, so grateful. And lastly, of course, uh, you are not alone, and HR is here to help you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really great. And I think, you know, <clears throat> one thing to always keep in mind is like, everybody's different, right? Everybody's brains work differently. Whether you're neurodivergent, neurotypical, our brains think differently. If, if all of our brains thought the exact same way, we would never brainstorm things because we would just know <laughs> exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> so, you know, in an ideal world, everybody would be on the same page and everybody would understand everything and we'd be holding hands and singing kumbaya all day. Like that would just be perfect. But, you know, society is growing, it's improving, it's evolving, it's, it's learning. And I think that's one thing to keep in mind is the fact that we all do think differently. We all speak differently. We communicate differently. And just being able to be open and understanding that not everybody's going to respond the exact same way you would 
is a great thing to like learn how to be able to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing that I definitely want to add before we close out is that like something that my fiance always says is your mental health is just as important as somebody else's mental health. So like you may be sitting there thinking, well, this other person on my team really needs these accommodations because they've got this going on and that going on and they really need the help and I just have this going on. So maybe I can like, I can deal with it. I don't need the extra help. I'll be fine. Never say that to yourself. If there is something you are struggling with or you need assistance with, reach out and ask because your mental health is just as important as anybody else's mental health. So, you know, I, you know, fight for yourself. Don't, don't suffer in silence. Like I mentioned earlier, mental health is that silent monster in the back of your head. Nobody else can see it. So sometimes, you know, you have to speak up. You have to say, hey, I need help with this. And then other people will follow suit and back you up and help you out every, any way they can. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you all so much for being here today. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Mental health is an invisible battle, and when it's compounded with variables such as being transgender or non-binary, it can turn that battle into a war. Having simple, inclusive benefits from your employer and support from allies can make such a big difference, and taking that next step to up to advocate makes a huge difference in people's lives. I am now going to open up the floor for questions. So our first question here for Christopher is, when should I ask my manager to accommodate versus when should I reach out to an accommodations expert? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I'm gonna say something really quickly, the, um, the expert part. I don't necessarily consider, consider my team to be an expert, right? I think um, you are an expert of yourself, right? We can't tell you exactly what you need and ex exactly what is going on with you, right? We're, our job is to be an advocate for you. So that's, our, that's the approach that I think um, in accommodations uh, we typically take. So in those situations where, you know, if, if it's great that you have that relationship with your manager and that you can reach out to your manager and ask those questions to say, hey, you know, these are my needs or whatever the case may be, then that's awesome. I'm, I'm really happy. Um, I know that a lot of times, especially outside of Intuit, there, those environments may not exist. So in those situations, that is absolutely the time for you to reach out to HR because we are your big advocates. We are there for you and we are wanting to help in any way that we can. Um, so we may not be the experts of you specifically, but we are definitely here to advocate for you and ask those questions and help assess what options are available to meet those needs, limits, or restrictions that you may have. Great, thank you, Christopher. Another question here, what can people leaders do to accommodate their employees who might not want to speak about their mental health issues in fear of losing their job or being seen in a negative light? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> can you repeat just that beginning part one more time? Yeah, what, what should people leaders do if you have employees that might not feel comfortable stepping up? So I think one of the biggest things that a people leader could do is you know, offering that open environment, right? Showing that you're a leader that is willing to have personal conversations, you know, being open to having a personal conversation. Um, if you're having a meeting automatically, like especially with the trans plus community, like if you say, hey, I'm Lyric and I use he, him pronouns right off the bat, people in the audience or in your meeting are gonna notice that, okay, you're either an ally, an activist, or activist, or you're in the community. Like, okay, I can talk to you about this. I might be able to bring this issue up. You know. So I think just opening opening yourself up to having those conversations is definitely a good way to start it, right? And then if you have people on your team or in the meetings you're in come to you to express a concern take everything that they have, right? Listen to everything they have to say, take in all the documentation. And if it's a situation where HR needs to be involved, help your teammate get HR involved to better execute what needs to happen down the road. Absolutely, and, and I think 
A really great example of that can actually be found here at Trans Summit in, um, in Jessica Dark. Throughout this entire planning process, um, it, it gets pretty intense sometimes, uh, planning an event like this. Like we all work really well together. We have a lot of passion around this work, but there's a lot of work to be done. And sometimes things get kind of hectic. Um, you can get really stressed out. You can get a little burned out sometimes too. And Jessica has always told us, you know, from day one, rule one was you and your mental health and your life come first. Nothing else comes before that. If you need to drop a meeting, if you need to reschedule some things, move some stuff around, let us know. But we can absolutely do that for you. We can accommodate you. And I think if you are a people leader and you sort of make things like that generally known, then you don't have to, then to get the support they need, people don't necessarily have to come up to you, disclose their entire mental health history, you know, uh, sort of tear out their heart and show it to you and be like, this is all the, these are all right. the problems I'm having. Um, you know, if you make it known that you're a, a person who's supportive in that space, um, you can make your employees feel much, much more at ease. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your answers to that. Um, uh, let's see here. What should I do if I'm facing harassment or discrimination after sharing my mental health history? Uh, definitely reach out to HR. Um, you know, I, I say that in a joking manner, but it's actually very serious. Like, please reach out to um, HR. If you are facing any type of discrimination, first of all, they're, they're, uh, HR is such a large organization in general, especially here at Intuit. We have our people team that have different functions where, you know, the information that you disclose to maybe an employee relations per, a representative may be very different from what you disclose to in accommodations. And we intentionally keep it separate in that way. But if you're facing a situation where you are being discriminated against or you are looking at something that potentially feels like retaliation, start Start that conversation with HR. We want to get involved. Like we really do want to get involved because we have a not only a goal of how we want to represent ourselves, but we care. We really care, and we really want all of our employees to be able to live, live, <laughs> work in a inclusive, accessible, and just overall. Um, amazing environment and if that's something and sorry i'm getting very passionate right now if, if that's something that you aren't necessarily experiencing then please 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 reach out to your hr department because that's not that it's not cool yeah yeah, definitely. I, I know one of the things that was so helpful in making sure my conversation with HR about my experiences was so successful was that I um, could remember and had recorded a lot of specific information about um, the, you know the interaction that I wanted to speak to them about. So if you if something like this happens to you um, and and screenshots are possible, always take screenshots. And if it's just an interaction with someone, um, write down as much of you can as much as you can remember about it as soon as you can after it happens that's really helpful too great well thank you all so much for joining us today virtually we really appreciate your attendance and thank you to our wonderful panelists